I'm Corinne Corbett, Editorial Director of Black Health Matters, and I'm excited to be talking today with Dr. Joy Harden Bradford, the noted psychologist, podcaster, and author of Sisterhood Heals, The Transformative Power of Healing in Community. Dr. Joy, as most people refer to you, I like the term sister friendships. Where did that come from? The term? Yeah, the term is nothing that I created. So that has been in the lexicon for quite some time. I'm actually not sure who invented that term. But I think, you know, when I t- when I use it, I'm referring to the idea that um, it, it's kind of like a cross between a sisterhood and a friendship, right? Because I do feel like there are some people who become more intimate and closer to us than just like a regular friend. And so sister friend, I think, really encapsulates what often happens in relationships between Black women. Right now, one of the things you write in the book is that we heal in community. And a lot of times people think about healing as an individual journey. Can you speak more about the importance of community in healing? Yeah, so I think it's important to note that a lot of the fractures that we have in our lives and a lot of the things that we've experienced in our lives that have become difficult for us are often at the hands of other people. And so when the hurt comes in community, then that means the healing has to happen in community as well. And so there are certain things that you can't, no matter how much you read and talk to a therapist, all of these things, there are certain things that you simply won't be able to work through unless you are doing it in relationship with other people. So for instance, if you have struggle with assertiveness or if you find yourself doing a lot of people pleasing, then the only way to really heal from those kinds of concerns is to be actively engaged with other people. And so healing in community really refers to this idea that there are a lot of things that can't be healed unless it is in relationship with other people. Yes, yes. And one of the things you promote or say in the book is the advantage that there's an advantage in group therapy. I think in our community, first, we have some trepidation about therapy in general. So speak to us about why we shouldn't be afraid of group therapy and the value of it. Yeah, and I I definitely hear those concerns because it is a little weird. You know, I think we have to be honest that a lot of us are concerned just about talking to one person. So maybe one therapist about like things that are going on with us. So when you introduce the idea of like going into a room of like six to eight strangers and telling them some very personal information, that definitely feels very foreign. So I definitely hear the concerns. But again, there are some concerns that I think come out just much easier and are easier to deal with in in relationship with other people. And one of the main premises behind why group therapy is often so effective is that a lot of times we are carrying shame related to something that has happened to us. Or we feel like, oh my gosh, I'm the only person who feels this way or the only person who's experienced anything like this. And when you enter into a group, you quickly realize that you are not alone with anything that you are feeling. And so group therapy really helps you to feel less alone and less isolated with those things that have been very difficult for you. The other thing that happens in group that is incredibly powerful is that you will see yourself kind of acting out in the same ways that you do in your outside of group life, right? So I already used the example of, you know, maybe somebody who is a people pleaser or who has difficulty kind of speaking up and being assertive. Well, that kind of thing will play out in group. And so the the job of the group facilitator is to then call attention to like, hey, Corinne, I see that you are struggling when so-and-so talks. I wonder if you want to say what's happening with you, right? Um, And so group really allows for some of those things that really um, impact us outside of group to be present in the group and for you to learn different ways of acting. How do we find good group therapy options? Yeah, so I think it is a little more difficult to find group therapy just because not as many therapists are offering group as individual therapy. Um, but it, we do have a website We on our website, therapyforblackgirls.com. We have a therapist directory there, and there is space for therapists to indicate whether they provide group therapy. Um, so that's one place. And most of the directories do offer space for people to talk about any groups that they're running. 
But another way that you can find out information about groups is asking the other people in your life, the other professionals you work with. So your primary care physician, if you have an OBGYN or other doctors that you're seeing, they may be aware of um, any groups that are being facilitated in their areas. So asking for referrals, I think, is a great way to find groups to participate in as well. You discussed the healing power of friendships and how they are therapeutic. Tell us more about that. So friendships, I think, really are therapeutic for us in lots of ways. So in the book, I talk about how many of the difficulties that we have in relationships are often connected to our attachment style. And our attachment style really refers to how we were tended to as young people, right? So were our caregivers responsive to us? Did they meet our needs? Or did they kind of, um, were they dismissive or really kind of leave us alone to fend for ourselves? And what that does is that if we have had caregivers who were attentive and really responding to us, then we grow up to feel like people will respond to us as adults and that people are there for us and we can have healthy relationships. But if not, then it becomes a little more difficult to engage in relationships. Sometimes we have a fear of abandonment. It feels really scary to need people because in the past you've needed people and they weren't there. And so what friendships really do is to help correct any attachment injuries that we have had as young people. So even though you may have had a mom or a caregiver who was not super responsive, you grow up and realize like, hey, everybody does not respond to me the way that my parents did. And so friendships really help to kind of um, really give us a different perspective of how relationships can go versus what we may have experienced early in life. As a black woman, as black women, we often spend a lot of time wearing a mask. Why is it critical for us to find safe spaces? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we we do wear so many masks and there's so much armor we often have on as black women in any space that we kind of navigate. And so it is good to have a place and it's important to have a place where you can take those masks off, where you can take that armor off and just kind of be authentically who you are um, because it's heavy. Right. Those masks and all of that, it gets exhausting to kind of have to do that posturing in different places in our lives. And so being able to have a sister circle or spaces where we don't don't have to do that is really good for our mental health because it does help to give us a bit of a reality check, right? Like I think when you have to do so much masking, it can be really easy to kind of lose yourself and like not be sure of like, am I the concern here or is this more a concerning environment that I find myself in? And so I think our sister circles really help us to get a reality check that it's not about us, that, that we are often entering hostile environments that require us to do masking. Let's delve into the therapy experience. How can we measure our progress? I think, you know, sometimes there is an aha moment, but most often there isn't. Like there isn't like a, okay, you get a credit, you know, get a um, graduation diploma or something that you're all healed. It doesn't often happen like that. I think often what happens is that we realize that we are responding to things differently, right? So maybe something that would have really um, upset us six months ago doesn't upset us as much anymore, or we're able to kind of um, regulate ourselves better in a distressing situation. Um, We realize that patterns that we had fallen into before, we are not repeating those same patterns. And so it typically is a much more gradual kind of thing. And this is why I think journaling can be really helpful because it can help you to kind of track some of those small gradual changes to let you know that I am in a very different place. When we read your book, it isn't something we should breeze through quickly. We have to do some work to get get the most out of it. Why did you design it that way? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, the book is really meant to be an active process. So I don't want, you know, you to just read it and say like, oh, okay, that was a great idea. But how can you actually take the information and then practice it within your sister circles? Next question. We often talk about relationship breakups, but why is mourning a friendship that has ended also necessary? Mm, that's so painful. It, it really is. And it's unfortunate when it happens. But because we are human, we know that all relationships do not last like our lifetimes, right? Because stuff happens. Um, and so it is an unfortunate reality and is a very painful one. I think, you know, lots of people are talking more and more about how friendship breakups feel so much more painful sometimes than even romantic breakups. And I think you when you think about like the world that you create with your sister 
of friends. It typically is very intimate. Um, there are like all these private stories and maybe even a language that only you all understand. Like you have created entire worlds together. And so when that relationship ends, then in a lot of ways that world ceases to exist anymore. And so it really is a grief process. Like you have to give yourself time to mourn what this relationship was as well as what you saw it being in the future. Like all of that then goes away. And so I think what often happens for people is that they try to brush past it. They try to say like, okay, I have plenty more friends or you hear from other people, right? Like, oh, get over it. You got other friends or it's easy to make friends, but you do have to honor the relationship that you had and allow yourself time to grieve. And I think, you know, it's, it's really important to call note to the fact that sometimes friendships end because something happened, right? So maybe there was a betrayal or, you know, whatever, but sometimes they end just because you become very different people and maybe your priorities are not aligned anymore your values don't align anymore and it's okay to to honor what was and to be able to let people go with grace and love right so just because we can't be in this friendship anymore doesn't mean that you have to have any ill intentions for this person like I think that it's okay to kind of say this was great for what it was and now we're moving in very different paths many of us have had people in our lives who make everything about them what is the best way to address that? I think being forthright with them, right? Because sometimes people are not aware of like how other people perceive them, right? Especially if they like grew up as an only child or there are lots of different circumstances where someone might become someone who is like always seeking the spotlight or always needs to be the center of attention. And so I think in a moment when you're not feeling frustrated is the best time to do this. So, you know, let's say you've had an exam or an experience with somebody like the day before, if you can wait until the day after and say, hey, I just want to, you know, call your attention to something or it's been my experience of you that it feels like whenever we're talking you always make the story about you I wonder if you notice that you do that and so just being able to kind of call it out in and not in an aggressive judgmental way but hey I just want you to know this thing about yourself and if you can share like I find when you do that, it makes it difficult for me to connect with you. So also letting them know, you know, that there are consequences, that this is how it's impacting your relationship with them. I think that that can be a very loving act. Do you, do you agree with those who say no more mm. new friends? <laughs> Yeah, this is such a, a bit, I think, an interesting topic to discuss because I think going back to our earlier conversation around attachment styles and how our early experiences then impact us in adulthood, I think a lot of people feel threatened in a circle with new people because they feel like that means there won't be a place for me anymore or maybe she's going to like her more than she likes me and, you know, like that kind of thing. So people are often a little afraid of what happens when you introduce new people to the dynamic. Um, and so, again, I think it's important to be able to have conversations about that. But I do think it is important for us to be open to new friends and new experiences. I often say that we have not met all the people who will love us yet. And we can only get to that place by continuing to be open to new experiences. So, you know, you can meet new people and they may not be ever be as close to you as like your college friends or friends you've grown up with through grade school. But there can be a very legitimate and important place for them in your life. And so I think as much as possible, we want to stay open to new experiences. What makes Black women's sister friendships so unique? Yeah, so I think one of the, the most important ways that the way that we are unique in how we create connection is because so much of our history is tied to one another, right? Like our relationships with one another have long, largely meant survival in a lot of cases, right? Like our ability to be able to look out for one another really has dictated like who we have been able to become in this country and in this world. Um, but I also think that there is a lot of nonverbal communication that happens for black women, right? Like we can just like share a look and a glance, even with somebody you don't know. And I think that there is often a shared understanding. And a lot of that, of course, comes from our history and our culture. Um, and so I do think that that we connect with one another in ways that maybe other people don't because of that shared history and because we often know what it is like to be the only one in a space. Or there are very particular things I think about where we find ourselves in the world that give us the shared connection that other people don't. What are your thoughts about how often we should be in touch with our friends? 
<laughs> yeah, you know, I think we are all different in terms of like what we need to feel kind of um, valued and seen in relationships. And so I think it's important to talk amongst your your sister circle about what everybody feels like they need to feel valued and feel a part of the circle. Um, but I do think it comes back to being intentional about spending time and, you know, taking care of one another. And I know uh, many of us are so, so busy, like there's a lot going on. And so I think it's important to put time on your calendar just like you do for everything else that you don't want to forget to put time on your calendar to spend time with your girl so I love you know I don't feel like there's anything that beats like in person get together so if you can plan like yearly girls trips or whatever that was that would be great um but if you can't then we know that there are lots of things that you can do virtually um staying connected through a group chat sending each other memes and random tiktok videos like there are lots of different ways that you can stay connected that are low touch but still very meaningful to people. And so I think being able to figure out what that looks like for every member of your sister circle is very important. How does friendship enhance our lives and health? Yeah, I mean, you know, many of us probably have heard, you know, about like this epidemic related to loneliness and like how so many people are struggling and particularly in the wake of like the pandemic, right? Um, We know that there has been a lot of loss of connection. And so you're very right that friendship and like staying connected impacts both our mental and our physical health. Like there's been research that talks about loneliness being as impactful and bad for us as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So it really is important for us to stay connected with people because again, we are not, we are not meant to do life alone. And so we know that we we fare better when we have a support system. So support systems really help us in difficult times, but they also just enrich our lives. They make things more meaningful. It's really important to kind of continue to have like new shared experiences with your sister circle and your friendships, because again, those are the things that kind of add to the value of our lives. When do we know when it's time to talk to a therapist? So I want to first start this conversation by, you know, letting people know that people often go to therapy way past when they probably should have made the call to a therapist because there's all these misconceptions about like, when should I talk with a therapist, right? And I think a lot of people feel like they have to be in a crisis situation. Stuff has had to hit the roof before they can reach out. But the truth is that there's a lot of benefit to be had in working with a mental health professional even before there is a crisis. So if you realize there are patterns that you're repeating, if there's something that you're just not happy with, definitely if you're experiencing any signs of like depression, anxiety, just not interested in things, maybe the way that you used to be, that is of course a time to reach out. But there are lots of other things before even any of those symptoms happen that would, you know, result in you reaching out to a therapist. So I've already mentioned that we have a directory on our website, um, but there are tons of other directories for people, especially for um, black people who are looking for therapists, for you to be able to search for a therapist in your area. Um, so one thing that you do want to figure out kind of on the front end is how you're going to pay for it. Um, so are you going to try to be using insurance? Are you going to pay out of pocket? Um, there are lots of organizations that will give you vouchers to pay for therapy. The Loveland Foundation is one that we've worked with quite a bit that does give black Black women and other women of color vouchers to be able to see a therapist a set number of times. And so after that, then you want to start doing your research on the therapist that you feel like would be helpful for you. So I think it's important to make sure you find a therapist who is trained in the thing that you are wanting. Um, so lots of therapists are active on social media or we have websites and you may like enjoy our personality or think like, oh, they seem like they would be cool to talk to. But if they've not actually been trained in the thing that you are struggling with, then no matter how cool they are, it may not be an, an, a helpful relationship to you because they may not have the training to be able to help you. And I also often tell people that sometimes finding a therapist can feel like dating in that you may meet and visit with a couple of different therapists before you find the one who is going to be a good fit for you. And it doesn't mean that you are a bad patient or a bad client or that they're a bad therapist. It just may not be a match in terms of the relationship. And so even though it's hard to kind of keep repeating Repeating your story to multiple people, it is important for you to find the therapist fit that you think is going to be best for you. What if that therapist is not the right fit? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. So you may feel the guilt, but there is nothing wrong with you just letting somebody know like, hey, I think somebody else would be a better fit for me. Um, and a part of our training is understanding that every client is not going to be a good fit for us. And so even though it may be hard for you to know that and say that, we do understand that somebody else may always be a better fit for us. And that's actually a great, a lot of people, even if they wouldn't say they struggle with assertiveness or like authority, being able to tell a therapist like, hey, I don't think that this this is a good fit is actually a great indicator of your ability to kind of navigate difficult situations and awkward conversations, which you want to do in other places in your life. So being able to tell a therapist like, hey, I just don't think that this is great will actually be very good for you. And, and typically the therapist may be able to help you find somebody who's a better fit, right? Like we typically know the colleagues in our area. And so if you say, hey, I need somebody who like assigns more homework or who does X, Y, Z, we may already have a suggestion for you. So having that conversation conversation can be really helpful to you getting to the therapist that is going to be a good fit. What do you hope readers will get out of your book? My hope is that it will provide very exciting conversation for the group chats. Um, so it really is meant to be able to like highlight a passage and then like say, hey, did y'all see this? Or, oh, this may, this reminded me of us. And to be able to really celebrate who you are in your sister friend circles. Um, but it is also an invitation for us to dig a little deeper about how we can repair some of the relationships and how we really can do a better job of like showing up for one another. I think what has happened, especially during the pandemic is that that we have realized that a lot of the systems that many of us thought would be there to kind of sustain us have largely crumbled. And so all we really have to rely on is each other. And so I also wanted to be a guide for how do we build um, community with one another so that we can be there and be reliable for one another. Um, but I, I really wanted to be the kind of thing that you read and then you tell all of your girls like, oh, y'all got to read this or you share it on social media and encourage other people to check it out so that we can continue having these kinds of conversations. Tell us about your podcast, Therapy for Black Girls. Mm -hmm. So the Therapy for Black Girls, we are actually entering our seven year, seventh year of the podcast, and it has been a lot of fun. Um, and the, the goal of the podcast is really to make mental health information more relevant and accessible for black women and girls. And so we do that through a variety of conversations. Um, I am typically in conversation with another therapist or somebody else who is an expert in their field talking about some element of mental health. Um, but I also really love pop culture. And so I love being able to to bring in um, episodes of shows that we're all loving. So if you listen to the podcast, if you're familiar, you know we had quite a few episodes related to like things that were happening in Insecure. Um, you know, so some of the shows that we are we are all watching, I bring in elements of those conversations to talk about like, hey, if this popular character went to therapy, here are some things they might want to talk about. And here's a therapist, here's how a therapist might work with them. Um, you know, so I, I think that that has been a really fun way to kind of make mental health real for people because I think for so long, we have only thought about mental health as like mental illness, right? So what are the signs of depression? What are the symptoms of anxiety? And of course, all of that is important, but there's a whole spectrum of other things that we want to be paying attention to as well that also impact our mental health. And so those are the kinds of conversations we aim to have on the podcast. Final question, where can we find your book? Yeah, so you can find the book at sisterhoodheels.com, but you can also find it hopefully in all of your local bookstores. Um, you can find it all the places that books are sold. And then you can find the therapist directory as well as the podcast at therapyforblackgirls.com. I can't thank you, Dr. Joy, enough yes. for talking with me today. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed chatting with you. Bye-bye.